hello, uh, now we scan. Uh, my name is Jamie Jacobs, and I'm here uh, today on the Tonawanda Seneca Territory. Uh, they asked me to um, do a quilt working demonstration for the Iroquois Indian Museum. Uh, apparently, there was a problem with my phone uh, going live on Facebook, so I couldn't do a live. Um, but you know, I'll do the best I can uh, with just a video. So. Um, I was born and raised on the Seneca Territory, uh, Tonawanda, in western New York, and I got into quill working probably about, uh, maybe about seven or eight years ago. Uh, I took a quill working class at Old Fort Niagara um, with Michael Galvin, and I kind of just went from there. Um, he just kind of taught like simple, you know, things on how to get started and you know how to get into quill work. So I, I took that class and that workshop, and then ever since then, just after that, I kind of, um, like, kind of taught myself um, other things and other techniques. Uh, sometimes I would ask uh, Michael for technical advice, and I just kind of went from there. But what really got me into co-working was I, I currently work at the Rochester Museum and Science Center in Rochester, New York. And they have a large collection of like Seneca artifacts. And when I start working there, I noticed that there was quill work in the collection that was labeled Seneca. And I kind of really, at the time, didn't really have any idea because I didn't really know too many people, especially Seneca's, uh, doing quill work. Um, everybody pretty much did like uh, beadwork and uh, you know ribbon work and things like that. So I, it really sparked my interest even more. So as I started to do like more research, like in uh, museum collections, um, Haudenosaunee people did a lot of quill work. Uh, they did moose hair embroidery, um, and they it kind of cut out like around the 1800s uh, because that's when seed beads started to become more. Like, like more widely distributed and more, uh, you know, like available. So the porcupines, you know, they weren't as available anymore just because of different reasons. Um, you know, like, you know, colonization, you couldn't just go out and hunt porcupines anymore. Um, you know, hunting grounds were being, you know, lost. Um, so, you know, porcupine quills just weren't, you know, available to Seneca's, you know, all that much. So beadwork kind of started to take over. Um, right around like the 1820s, 1830s, we see Seneca starting to do a mix of quill work and bead work. And then a couple more years later, it just all kind of switches over to bead work. <clears throat> so, um, so first of all, I, I've, the way I, I collect quills, because that seems to be like the first question I always get, is I get them any way I can, um, whether it's roadkill um, I don't particularly just go out and look for roadkill because there's no porcupines in my area. So when I say roadkill, I have to go somewhere or just be driving somewhere where I know there's porcupines and then maybe find one on the road. But I won't do that in the summertime. Um, so you can get them on the internet. Um, you know, I, I bought some off eBay. You know, they're pretty good. I've never gone out and put a blanket on a porcupine and took the blanket home and, put, you know, quick the quills off, like, Everybody thinks that that's like something that you can just easily do, and it's not. Um, so you kind of have to just get them any way you can. Um, you know, hunters, you know, I know people that hunt, but obviously they don't just hunt porcupine, and, you know, they don't really ever see them. So if, if I'm lucky, they'll hunt and kill one and then, you know, send me the quills. Uh, the way I dye them is um, I obviously are, you know, indigenous plants um, were used you know, you know, mostly back then. Uh, I never really got into the traditional dyeing just because collecting quills, sorting quills, washing them, it's, it's a ton of work already. So to go out and collect like plants for natural dyes and then learn that whole chemical process is just a whole nother discipline that I just never really spent time on. Um, so I use RIT dye. You can buy it at the store. Um, I know there's other people that use Kool-Aid Right, so they just pour a, a thing of Kool-Aid, you know, into hot, into warm water, and then they soak their quills. Um, I don't, I've never used Kool-Aid. Um, there's nothing wrong with using Kool-Aid. If it works, it works. Um, I've just, I started out using Rick dye, and then I kind of just, you know, stuck with it as I went. 
Um, but again, like you know, quill work is um, it's it's really tedious. Um, I use I only use brain brain tan smoke leather. Um, I don't ha I don't I, I started out using like regular commercial leather because it was less it was less expensive. Um, but then I figured out that it just really wasn't. It's not really made for quill working. Um, so this is a piece that I have here. Um, it's it's for a knife sheath. Um, it's just a panel, but you can see that I use this this uh, brain tan leather. Um, it's it's been dyed with black walnut hulls. Um, so Seneca's used to just you know they would dye their, their they would brush this leather on or even just dip it in and let it dry. Um, but you can see here this is a piece that I I've, I've been working on the last you know week or so. I actually have two of them because I have a set. So there's there's two pieces here um, that kind of kind of started. So these are just the panels. Uh, I'll sew these together and you know make uh, you know make a sheath. But I always do them. I always do my quilt panels separate, and then I put and then I sew everything together uh, into a final piece. Um, so if you look at quills, um, <clears throat> so here's a quill here. I don't know if it's kind of hard to see on the video, but you can see this dark, this black end. That's the dangerous end. You don't want to get poked by that um, because you know that's it's it's got barbs on it, so it'll stay in your skin and it'll be really difficult to get out. Um, so here's a dyed quill. Um, people do ask me if, if there really is red quills on a porcupine. Um, there's there's not there's no such thing as I that I know of as uh, as a red porcupine. Um, I don't cut my ends like like pre-cut. Um, just because you have to soak the quill in order to make it soft and pliable to work with. And if you pre-cut the ends, the water gets inside the quill. And the inside of the quill is just like this natural foam like kind of material. And the water kind of just starts to dissolve it right away. So if you try to soak this or cut the end off and then soak it, um, water gets inside there and it kind of just, you know, you go to flatten it and it just comes out like toothpaste sometimes. So I don't ever really, I don't ever pre-cut my, my ends. Um, but what I do is uh, to avoid, you know, because when I, because we're not going to use that when you do work. So what I do is I stick it either in like a styrofoam cup or a bowl that I have, or I stick it in a napkin like this, and then I cut it. And then that way the end is stuck in the napkin and it's not like on the floor or anything. Um, so to get this really nice, so um, a lot of the older quill work, um, they didn't really have like neon colors or like bright, you know, like, you know, like, like flashy colors. Um, that's more like contemporary, at least in the Northeast. Um, so the, the main colors that the primary colors that the Haudenosaunee people use were like red, um, white, white is the natural color, um, black, uh, yellow, uh, light blue, and then a little bit of green, but they start using green more because they would use the dust from the uh, brass pots. So the brass pot has like copper in it and then, you know, it kind of like, you know, oxidizes and then they, they collect that dust and you have this green. So they use that for green dye actually. Um, so you see a lot more green, you know, um, being used later on. And when I say later on, I mean like um, 1700s, uh, late 1700s, um, because 1700s seems to be like this renaissance era for quill work where all these nations around the Great Lakes, and then even out as far as out west, um, they're doing like all kinds of like quill work and making these pieces that are just like awesome. So, um, but the you know the the flashier colors, uh, at least from my own experience and my own research, uh, seem to come in like you know when people start doing like um, you know like like you know contemporary style dancing and competition style dancing. But again, I might be wrong. You know, maybe. A tribe had a you know neon green or a pink you know back in the day I just, but um, but just for you know what I do um, this is what I've you know what I've found um, so the tools I use uh, I use a small pair of scissors uh, these were made for fly fishing uh, because you know fly fishermen make their own little flies and they do really delicate small work so they have a so they're really nice they're really you know they're made with a really good metal and they got really fine tips on them <coughs> um, I use these needles um, it's kind of hard to see on the camera, but these are just uh, short golden eye needles. Um, can't remember what size they are exactly. Um, but I tried to use the beading needles that are flexible, but you know they kind of just bend and they break. Um, but whatever you prefer, that's that's whatever works for you. Uh, 
I know some coworkers do use those. Uh, I don't use them. Uh, I like these because they don't bend, so they're not like really flexy, uh, flexible. Um, so they, you know, I mean, they will bend, but if you have to apply a lot of pressure. Uh, the thread I use, um, I started out using the nylon Nymo thread. Uh, obviously, back in the day, they would have had like sinew, or they would have used some kind of like natural made cordage. Um, but I use like this nylon thread. Um, it, this this isn't Nymo. This is a different kind of beading thread. So I use like um, um, beading thread. <coughs> So obviously you have to soak your quills, um, then you flatten them, and then you um, start sewing them on the leather. So there's different kinds of techniques, um, and like I said, it's really, you know, it's really uh, time-consuming just to sit down and set up a project. Um, so some coworkers just do freestyle, and they just they don't draw lines. Um, but I do draw lines. Um, I use this little sharpie pen, and it's brown. So it kind of blends in with the leather. That way you don't see all these marks after I get done with my work. Um, some people don't. They just use pencil and then it kind of wears away. Uh, some people use the disappearing ink ones. But the problem is that when you soak your quill, your quill is going to have a little bit of water on it. And then all of a sudden your line disappears anyway. Uh, but with this one, it really leaves a really fine mark. Um, fine enough to where like, if you're good enough or when you do get good enough, uh, you won't end up seeing the pen line uh, after you, you know, start doing your work. So if you look on here closely, um, there are pen lines on there where I had really nice marks, but you can't really see them. You don't really notice them. You can probably see one right there, um, but that'll get covered up anyway. <coughs> so um, you won't really see it in the final like product because I'm going to have stuff over it and I'll do lines, you know, more line work on it. So this right here is zigzag. Uh, this is what the Hodino Shoni did uh, quite a bit. Um, so then this one here is a single line of quill and this one here actually is actually two colors of quill laid on top of one another so when you fold back and forth you put a, a white one and a black one on top of one another and then when you fold this way you're gonna see the white and then when you fold it back this way you're gonna see the black so white black white black and then that's how you get um, that that like I don't know, like a shark tooth pattern and then when you do patterns like this, you can see how I have two quilled lines. And in order to get these diamonds, you have to make sure that your both lines fold like on the same like on the same area. <clears throat> so you can see like up close that you can see how those quills are folding right at the exact same spots on both lines, and that's how I can get these diamonds to line up like that. So with the single line quill, you only need one needle and one thread, um, and then but with the zigzag, you actually need two needles and two threads. You're working at the same time because you're going back and forth. Um, the only th the only sewing you see on the other side is my knots. Um, so when you do quill work, you only go through the surface of the leather, and that's it. Again, some people have their own methods. Some people do go all the way through the leather. Um, but I don't. So when we say through the surface of the leather, so I'll make a little fine stitch here and just give you, so that's kind of what you want to look for, like right there. So that's kind of what a stitch for a quill work should look like. If it's too long, like this, you're going to have too much space on that fold. And the quill is just not going to look right on, you know, when you fold it on the one edge. If it's too fine, if you don't go in far enough, when you pull the the thread and the needle, the needle is just going to pull right out of the, you know, out of the leather. And if you go too deep, if you go too deep, like you're going to have a hard time getting the uh, the needle in and out. Uh, you know, of the leather as you go and your fingertips are just going to get really raw and then you're going to have to sit there with pliers and, you know, you shouldn't really have to use pliers you know, to do quill work. <coughs> so, <coughs> that's about what you want to do for zigzag. So when you do zigzag, so I do my knot on one side, pull it through, and then I do like a little, so I'll kind of show you just on this piece really quick just because I'm getting low on time already. <clears throat> kind of what you want to... I'm 
So here's kind of a stitch on what your for doing quill work should look like. So you can see like I kind of went through the leather and now I have this loop. So inside that loop is where your quill is going to fold and then it's going to fold inward over the thread. Um, that way you don't see like none of the thread. So if you look on my folds here you don't see any thread. That's because the quill is folding over it. So what I do is I put a quill through this loop like this. So the quill goes through the loop. Here we go. And then I pull the loop tight. So I'm showing you with my finger because it's kind of a little bit easier to see. Right? So if my finger was a quill, I would fold the quill this way. So it would fold over the thread and then now you don't see the thread. <clears throat> so that's kind of what you want for the zigzag. And then on this side you'll have another loop. So your loops are going to be perpendicular to your line and it's going to fold back and forth, back and forth, you know, like kind of like a shark tooth pattern. And you know, and, and that's kind of how we get that. Um, so there's all kinds of different like um, there's like so here's one with a sawtooth without the black and white, it's the same color. Um, so you know, that's kind of what, you know, how you get that. Um, again, there's just, you know, if you, you can buy like the quill working of North America, uh, I think that's what it's called, um, and look in there, uh, that'll help you out. Um, so you flatten your quill. Um, I use like, people use their fingers. Um, people use like different tools to flatten it. And I've even heard people, I, I get this all the time where people say they put them in their mouth and then they flatten them with their teeth. You know, they will tell me their grandma did it or whatever. Um, that's fine. Like I said, whatever works for you. But just know that porcupines roll around in their own feces. Um, so you have to wash and clean the quills really good uh, before you, you know, put them in your mouth if that's how you want to do it. Because obviously their ancestors probably didn't walk around with a bowl to fill with water to soak their quills. So they, they probably did do that. Um, because warm water or more spit or warm spit will flatten your, will soften your quill up you know, a little bit faster. Um, but that's kind of how we, you know, that's kind of how I, I flatten. I, so I flatten it with a spoon. I don't use the edge of the spoon, I use the rounded part. Because if you use the edge, you're going to crimp and probably cut your quill anyway. Um, so I use that, um, you know, like that rounded part. I've seen bone flatteners, and that's what they look like. They look like spoons, like where they, you can see where they were rubbing the quill uh, to flatten it. Um, so that's, you know, quill work. And, uh, again, I wish I could have done it in person uh, at the museum, uh, but this is what I have for today. So stay safe, wash your hands, uh, especially if you do quill work too. Um, you know, like I said, you're, you you want to make sure you, your hands are clean after you're, you know, or as you're walking. So uh, I usually don't sit there and eat like potato chips as I'm quilling, um, just because I'm touching quills and who knows if I've washed them or uh, rinsed them good enough. Um, so. Um, I hope that'll help you out. Uh, I'll post the video and I'll take some questions.